Hello, everyone. Welcome to our broadcast today. Thank you for joining me. I'm Jerry Savelle, and I believe I have a message for you today that's going to be a blessing to you and hopefully will inspire your faith. You know, if you've been a faithful viewer of our broadcast, you've heard me say this many, many times, and I'm going to keep saying it. Don't quit. No matter what you're going through, never, never, never quit. Don't ever give up on God. Don't ever give up on His Word. God is working behind the scenes right now, and He is going to cause something good to happen in your life. Now, today we're going to be talking about how do you respond to adversity? You know, we all experience it. There's not anybody that, that knows the Lord that's a believer that hasn't experienced adversity, and we will continue to do so, but there's a right way to respond. There's a wrong way to respond. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. You could translate the word tribulation as test and trials, adversity. But notice he said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So this is the right way to respond in adversity. Don't ever lose your joy. Be of good cheer. Why? Because it's not over yet. Give God time. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on His Word. If you will stay in faith and refuse to quit, then God is going to see you through. I'm going to take you in a service where I was teaching this right here at Heritage of Faith. And I believe, once again, if you'll listen closely, it's going to be a great inspiration to your life. I want you to open your Bibles, first of all, this morning to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. I want to read one verse. It's found in verse 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I heard someone say many years ago, and I can't improve on it, so I'm just going to borrow it. That adversity is a pivotal moment in our lives that calls for some kind of response. We all experience adversity from time to time. Some of you are experiencing it right now. People watching. Adversity is taking place in their lives and some are not responding to it as they should or as the Bible teaches. There is a right way and there's a wrong way to respond to adversity. The Bible way always works, always produces results. The Bible way is not always in the natural, the sensible way. It doesn't make sense to our natural mind sometimes. But it's God's way, the Bible way, and it always works. So we're going to talk about this morning as I've been directed by the Holy Spirit to share with you, and I just simply am calling it, how do you respond to a crisis? How do you respond to adversity? Now, I want to make a few statements here before I uh, continue reading the scripture, and I want to say these to you. I, I wrote this down this morning, and I don't want to overlook any of it, so I'm just going to read it right off my notes. Everyone responds to adversity in some way, either positive or negative. No one remains neutral. And how you respond reveals what you're made of. I'm going to say that one again. How you respond reveals what you're made of. Don't allow yourself to become dejected or discouraged and don't allow fear to creep in when you're facing adversity. Stay focused on what God's word promises. Look at this as an opportunity to show your adversary that you are not moved and that your trust is in the Lord and that he will make a way for you to overcome. Turn this negative situation into something productive. Show the devil that he's not dealing with a coward nor a quitter. 
And never forget that your future is still bright. God has already arranged this for you. Press on, as the Apostle Paul would tell us. Refuse to believe that you are hopelessly constrained by your circumstances. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, including overcoming what you're going through right now. You have the capacity for resilience. The Holy Spirit's in you will assist you to bounce back no matter how severe your attack has been. Amen. I know most of you, and I'll take a little sidetrack here, I know most of you know that uh, I'm a boxing enthusiast. I love boxing. No, you don't understand. I love boxing. (laughs) And I've had the privilege of going to many, many professional very, some of which were called the fight of the decade, the fights over the years. I don't go to them anymore. I just watch them on TV when they come on. But my reason for bringing it up is I've been to many fights where someone got knocked down, almost knocked out, and kept getting back up. They just wouldn't accept defeat. And that's always uh, amazed me to see the resilience of some people. I told Evander Holyfield one time, uh, I I went to watch Evander train for the Olympics. Uh, Carol and I went to the Olympics, went to all the boxing matches and watched Evander in those uh, Olympics. And then when he turned professional, if I had an opportunity, I'd go watch him fight. And uh, uh, when I would go to Creflo Dollar's church, Evander would, was a member of that church. And, and in between services, they had two morning services. In between services, Evander would come into the speaker's room and uh, visit with me. And, uh, and of course, we'd talk about the Lord. But before it was over, with, we'd talk about boxing. Then we'd talk about the Lord again. And uh, I told him one time, I said, Evander, I've been watching boxing all my life. I go as far back as listening to it on radio with my dad when Joe Lewis was fighting, when Sugar Ray Robinson was fighting, and and the the old-time boxers. And uh, I said, and when they had the Friday night fights on television when I was a kid, Dad and I'd sit there every Friday night and watch those fights, and Dad and I both would be ducking and weaving, you know. And and, uh, I said... But I've never seen anybody that is more focused than you are when you come out of that dressing room. He is so focused. I mean, just determined that I'm going to win and nobody's going to take my belt away from me. And many times, if you ever watched it and they show him coming out of the dressing room, you'll see his mouth moving. He's praying in tongues. (laughs) Amen. Amen. He prayed in tongues. And, and, and that big fight, the first fight that he had with Mike Tyson, if any of you see it, yes. if you remember, the song that was playing when he was walking to the ring is a song that's, the words are uh, 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 about, I will dance like David danced. I will shout like David shouted. I don't know the name of it, but that's it. And that was playing. Thousands of people in that arena and hundreds of thousands watching on television. When the Spirit of the Lord comes on my life, I will dance like David danced. Now, who is going to beat a fighter singing that when he comes out? You know? <laughs> but I've seen him get knocked down. In fact, one of the first fights that he fought in Atlanta, where he's from, as a professional... Uh, he got knocked down in that fight in his own hometown. That's a bad place to fight to fight, in your own hometown. But when, when he got knocked down and the guy looked like he was going to, you know, defeat Evander, but he just kept getting up. Resilience. Resilience. You know, people that don't even have the Holy Spirit know about resilience. Amen. And you and I are filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. Amen. That we should never stay down. We might get knocked down from time to time, but we never stay down. Amen. For you and I to stay down is to just quit because there's no reason for it. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, I may not know what you're going through, but I do know this. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, then it's never over until God says it's over and God will never say it's over until you win. Can you say amen? amen. <clears throat> Look at your neighbor and say, I've got Holy Ghost resilience. So once again, you have the capacity for resilience. The Holy Spirit in you will assist you in bouncing back no matter what you are presently going through. Keep a positive mindset and a winner mentality. Look at your neighbor and say, keep a positive mindset and a winner mentality. Say it again. Keep a positive mindset and a winner mentality. Constantly decree, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, I am a world overcoming, overcomer, and nothing shall be impossible unto me. Say that with me. I am a world overcomer, and nothing shall be impossible unto me. Now, let me give you some scriptures that deal with Adversity and what we can expect from God. I'm not going to ask you to turn to them. I'll just read them to you. You might want to make a note of them, look them up yourself. Psalm, Psalm 94, 13 from the message translation. God will never walk away from his people, never desert his precious people. Rest assured that justice is on its way. Psalm 9, 9. The Lord will be a refuge in times of trouble. The Passion Translation says he'll be a perfect hiding place. Verse 10 from the Passion Translation says, May everyone who knows your mercy keep putting their trust in you, for they can count on you for help no matter what. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful promise. Amen. Psalm 27, verse 1 and verse 3 from the message translation. With him on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. When besieged, I'm calm as a baby. When all hell breaks loose, I'm collected and cool. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, I'm cool. <laughs> They'll say, I'm cool. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry... And the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2 from the Passion Translation. God, you are, you're a proven help in time of trouble, more than enough and always available, so we will never fear. These are just a few verses talking about the promises of God to be with us and to comfort us and to deliver us in times of adversity. And obviously there are many, many more, but the bottom line is God can be depended upon. Thank you for your enthusiasm. God can be depended upon. If we keep our eyes on him, keep our eyes on his word, stay in faith, then everything's going to turn out just right. Refuse to faint, refuse to give up, and refuse to quit. And then look at somebody and tell them this. Help is on its way. Believe me, I know because he's never let me down. And I've faced adversity just like you do. Some of which you will never face because you're not responsible for what I'm responsible for. To whom much is given, much is required, the Bible says. But trust me, in 51 years, God has never let me down. Hallelujah. Now, I had to take a stand. And having done all the stand, I stood. And sometimes it wasn't easy. Sometimes I'd ask the Lord, what else do I need to do? And he'd say, stand. I said, I'm doing that. What else? He said, stand. Now you're scriptural. Having done all the stand, stand. I wanted to say often, 
Is there anybody else up there? I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> but I know you're not going to change God's mind nor his word, having done all to stand. There was someone asked me just a few days ago on the phone. Um, I, was, I was talking to this person. They said, my faith is weak. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been through so much. I just don't think I can take any more. I said, sir, and he was a friend of mine. I knew him well. I said, sir, if you can't take any more, then Jesus failed at Calvary. Come on. Come on, God. Amen. Amen. If you can't take anything the devil can dish out, then the blood of Jesus didn't work. The death and resurrection of Jesus didn't work, but it did. And you can take anything the devil can dish out. Amen. 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 Now, what I was endeavoring to do was to stir him up. It's like I remember years ago, there was a, a man up in Nebraska. Uh, we had gone up, uh, I'm sorry, in Kansas. We'd gone up to do some meetings in this meeting in Kansas. And uh, uh, a man that had helped us arrange the meetings, he said, uh, I've invited the meanest, baddest man in this town to the meeting tonight. And uh, I said, what's he so bad and mean about? He said, well, he's, he, he fights all the time. He gets drunk. He's in and out of jail all the time. He's just a bad man. But I've invited him to come tonight. Well, he came and got saved and got filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. And, and believed that he had been called to the ministry. Now, he was like the Apostle Paul, you know. He was like the Apostle Paul. Nobody wanted to be around him right away. You know, when Paul was still Saul of Tarsus before he got born again, there were some people who wasn't sure that, you know, it took in him because you know, he's so mean, you know. And, and this guy, he was mean, and, uh, but he got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he believed he's called to preach. So he said, can I call you every once in a while to get some advice? I said, sure. So he'd call and, and uh, he'd been listening to one of, back then it was tapes. He'd went listened to one of my tapes and this is in the late seventies. And he'd listen to Brother Copeland, listen to Brother Hagin. And boy, when I'd answer the phone, it sounded like all three of us all at one time. Just, he just, he just preaching everything he'd heard us say. And boy, he was fired up. You'd have to, you'd have to put the phone way out here because he's shouting. I said, I believe you, man. I believe you. And then, and then, and then we'd hang up and he'd do that quite often. And, uh, he'd get excited. He had to, he had to have an outlet, you know, he had to tell it, share it to somebody. Well, one day he called and he was crying. I said, is this? And I called his name. He said, yeah. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, it's not working, Brother Jerry. It's not working. I've done everything you said, Brother Copeland said, and Kenneth Hagin said, and it's not working. And oh, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, boy, I was lied to about you. He said, what? I said, well, before I met you, I was told you was the baddest man in town. Sound like a wimp to me. And I was glad he was in Kansas and I was in Fort Worth. <laughs> You can say that over the phone, you know. I said, you sound like a wimp to me. He said, I am not a wimp. And boy, he started in confessing the word. And in a little while, I had to put the phone way out here again. Boy, he got so fired up. Praise God. Sometimes you just need to talk people into winning. I said, sometimes you just need to talk people into winning. Amen. I, I remember my dad before he passed away, he, he'd had severe heart attacks as, as young as 50 years old. And we didn't even know it. We didn't know it was heart attacks. But later, uh, he had severe heart attack and, and wasn't expected to live much longer. But I just knew it wasn't time for him to leave and I wasn't, going, I wasn't willing to let him go. And so I'd have to go over to his house. And sometimes he'd be laying in bed there and he'd, and my mom, I, I asked my mom one time, I said, where's dad? She said, well, he's in his bedroom. 
I said, what's he doing? She said, well, last time I was in there, he was crying. I said, what's he crying about, Mom? She sa- he said, well, he, he, he just, it's, he's tired. I said, well, I'll go in and talk to him. So I went in there and pulled up a chair next to him, laid my hands on his chest, kissed him on the cheek like I always did, and uh, told him I loved him. I said, Dad, uh, what are you crying about? He said, son, I'm tired. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can go much longer. And so I said, well, Dad, just lay there and let me preach to you a little bit. So I preached to him, and boy, he, you could see you could see the fire coming back, you know. I had to talk my dad into winning. I had to talk him into living because he'd given up, and I talked him into living. Well, it wouldn't be, you know, several months later, and he'd be down again. And one day I said, uh, I went over there and I said, Dad, I want you up and dressed in the morning at 9 o'clock. I'm coming to get you. He said, where are we going? I said, I'll tell you when we get there. Just be up and dressed. You're going with me. And so we got in the car and we headed out to Texas Motor Speedway. I had hired a driver and put my dad in one of those race cars and hired that man to drive him 20 laps. And boy, my dad lasted another 15 years. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, I, I'm just trying to get him inspired, get him fire back. Because dad raced cars all my young life. And I knew being in a race car, man, that adrenaline would get to pumping again, you know. And, and, uh, and, and yeah, he just kept living then, praise God. And he lived to be about, what was it, 70? About around 70 or 72, something like that. 72, I believe it was. Sometimes you just have to uh, talk people into winning. You know, encourage people into winning. Don't ever, don't ever sympathize with people. They don't need sympathy. Sympathy looks at the problem and says, yes, you have a problem. I wish there was something we could do. A believer should never say, I wish there was something we could do. There is something we can do. Amen? They don't need sympathy. Sometimes they just need, and I'll say this just as kind as I can, sometimes they just need the the slack jerked out from under them. The slack jerked out of them. You know? And, you know, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where someone came to Jesus with a major problem, a major issue, and he put his hand on him and patted him, bless your darling heart. (laughs) Nobody has ever been through what you're going through right now. I think I'm going to tear up. No. Sometimes he just got right in their face. Amen. He said, do you really believe I can do this? Yeah, Lord. (laughs) Amen. So how you respond to adversity is going to determine, obviously, your outcome. And a lot of Christians respond to it in a negative way. And that's the reason why they don't get very far into God's best for their lives. Now, let's read this scripture again. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Another word for adversity is the word crisis. The 1828 Webster Dictionary defines adversity or crisis, and listen to this, as an event or events which oppose your success. Adversity or a crisis is defined, once again, as an event are events that oppose your success. So now it is very obvious where this is coming from. God's not opposed, uh, opposing your success. God's not against you being successful or prosperous. In fact, he's for it. Amen. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to prosper. So a crisis or adversity obviously 
is coming from our adversary. Why do so many born-again Christians never realize their full potential and live defeated lives? Do you know what to do when hardships and challenges arise? In today's special offer, the How to Respond to Adversity Package, you will receive Jerry Savelle's four-part CD series, Breaking Through the Impossible, and his popular book, The Force of Joy, and his recent book, The Faithful Shall Flourish. In this package, Jerry teaches how to be persistent in faith, why God can be trusted, and one of the fastest ways to see a breakthrough. In the midst of adversity, you can respond in faith and confidence, knowing what God has promised is on the way. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the How to Respond to Adversity special package. Don't fall for the trap of discouragement and doubt. Order today to experience God's breakthrough power in your life. Let me encourage you to make the decision right now, a quality decision, one that you will not back away from, you'll not give up on. And that quality decision is this, I refuse to quit. I refuse to give up. I refuse to back down. God is on my side. And if God is for me, who can successfully be against me? That should be your attitude. Amen. I want to read a scripture to you before we close today. It's found in Psalm 94, verse 13, the message translation. And it says, God will never walk away from his people, never desert his people. Rest assured that justice is on its way. That's an encouraging word. God will never walk away from his people. God will never walk away from his people. Rest assured, justice is on its way. I want you to lift your hands right now and say, I know God knows what I'm going through and he's working behind the scenes. Amen. Don't forget now our special resources today. Four CDs entitled Breaking Through the Impossible. Breaking Through the Impossible. And then my little book on the force of joy. This is worth right here, this little book, whatever you uh, spend to get these resources, it's worth having this little book in your possession. And then the faithful shall flourish. God has promised that he will take care of faithful people. If you've made a decision that you're a faithful person, then get ready. God is going to do some miracles in your behalf. So join me again next week as we continue this study. And until then, remember, your faith will overcome the world. 